Hi there, guys, and welcome to this week's edition of the Weiss Crypto Sunday Special with me, your host, Chris Coney. My guest analyst today is Maria, and the macroeconomic topic that we will be discussing is on-chain metrics. It's one of my favorite topics, this one, at least it is at the moment. So this whole field of analysis has kind of cropped up, and it's exclusive to crypto because when it says on-chain, it's like on the blockchain. And because blockchain technology is transparent, it allows us to do this whole new field of analysis. So Maria, please start us off here. When we say on-chain metrics, what exactly are they and why do they matter? Hi, Chris. Uh, when we say on-chain metrics, it means the information which we can extract from the blockchains. Since majority of the blockchains are transparent, there's a tons of information which we can extract from there related to the transactions, related to the usage of uh, the centralized applications, the flow of cryptocurrencies, etc. So there are many, many things which are very important. Mm -hmm. So why, why does this data matter? I mean, what, what kind of things can they tell us, this data on the, on the chain? Well, they can help investors. For example, if you have invested in some token, you would be interested to know if the usage of the token, uh, the number of the transactions are growing or falling. Uh, if you have invested in, uh, for example, a governance token of some uh, decentralized application, you would be interested to know how is that the centralized application performing and the token, how it's performing. Uh, you would be interested to know, uh, uh, is the number of active wallet users growing? Uh, is the number of general wallet users growing or, uh, you know, falling? And there are all sorts of information which are very important to investors. There are things which are important to traders. For example, you can find out uh, the inflows or outflows of cryptos uh, from and to centralized and decentralized exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can know and find out uh, if if a majority of investors want to sell their crypto, if there's there are large inflows, or they're just buying and accumulating and sending them uh, to their wallets. Uh, you know, you can find out, you can look at the dormant wallets, uh, very, very large wallets dormant for, I don't know, seven years or more. You can check if they're moving, if people are spending from those wallets, if the old hodl hodlers, um, very, very long-term investors are selling or not. So there, there are tons of information which you can find out. And yeah. it's, it's, it's quite important. So that's, that's the bit I've seen passed around a lot recently. The, the flows in and out of major exchanges. So I suppose with like Bitcoin, um, if people are generating a new address every time they receive a transaction, it's kind of hard to track that, which is what individuals do. But with exchanges, it's a bit different. Like with my exchanges, they give me like a single Bitcoin address for all my deposits, right? So at least you could then see that that will always be the same. So in that instance, you would be able to you'd know that wallet belongs to a, a particular exchange, right? And then you could see how many Bitcoin were flowing into that. Or if it were a stable coin, you could see how many, how much tether was flowing in or out. And what most people were saying recently is if a lot of Bitcoin, let's say, is being taken off centralized exchanges, the assumption is that people aren't intending to sell it in the short term. Is that is that basically it? Yes, that's okay. true. Uh, for example, we are tracking lots of things in uh, uh, as a wise analytic department. And the last week we've seen there have been many, many outflows, uh, more outflows than inflows. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we are also tracking spe specific exchanges like uh, Coinbase or Binance or Huobi. And because it's very important, we can say that uh, Coinbase, we know that the Coinbase is mostly used by, by uh, institutions. Mm. And uh, we know that Binance is mostly used by retail investors. Mm. So we can check who is, who is accumulating more uh, at the moment. Is it uh, uh, institutional investors? Is it retail, etc.? We can check uh, some of the Chinese exchanges where we can see how the miners are um, are they selling or not? Um, 
so yeah, like last week, we, we've seen a lot of accumulation by both retail and institutional investors mm -hmm. uh, uh, when, we, when it comes to Bitcoin. But when it comes to Ethereum and Link and BNB, Doge, LTC, uh, we've noticed that there, there were much more, there were many uh, inflows to exchanges since those coins were, you know, reaching all-time highs and jumping like crazy while bitcoin was kind of um uh, you know stagnant mm -hmm. and uh, that's why people are probably depositing them to exchanges to try to time the top or trade or just you know just to be prepared it's that's a normal reaction that's interesting so that would suggest like if so let's say litecoin runs up in price uh you see this big inflow of litecoin into exchanges because people are like preparing to take profits. Exactly. They're just preparing to take profits, which doesn't necessarily mean that they will sell, but it's it's what it is. And it's a usual reaction when the when the when the coin is uh, doing like this on the chart. Yep. It means sideways. that people are yeah, sideways people are accumulating and using the, you know, you can see a lot of outflows. Um, yeah. Okay, that was interesting what you said about the because like Coinbase provide um, services to institutions and so on. So that's that's actually how we start to some. I mean, it's not it's not it's not uh, absolutely precise, but it gives us some indication whether it's institutions or retail investors or like what's happening, right? So the other thing I was going to say is <clears throat> when we see say outflows of Bitcoin from Binance, do we know where that's going? I mean, we assume. People are putting it in their ledger, I suppose. But do we know where that's going? Yeah, we can see where, where it's going. Like, uh, we can track it. Uh, we don't cur currently track specifically where the Binance um, uh, funds are going. But yeah, it's possible to track. Okay, sure. And, uh, well, the most important thing for me is to see that, uh, you know, is to track uh, the decentralized applications and how they are performing since they are now the big thing and uh, those governance tokens for applications or uh, things like that this is what's very very important but at the same time we can also see that there is a huge outflow or or shift from the number of bitcoin and ethereum held uh, especially ethereum held on centralized exchanges to uh a DeFi. Mm -hmm. So people are definitely going non-custodial, which is right. amazing. It is. Uh, I did wonder like, actually. If you look, yeah. if you look at the, if you look at the charts, you will see that uh, the number of ether ether on centralized exchanges is the supply is just falling down. There is very very few ether on centralized exchanges right now. Also Bitcoin. But if you look at the supply of Ether, which is being used non-custodially on uh, DeFi, it's just growing. So it's uh, it's amazing thing. Right. So yeah, we can say that uh, the centralized environment is definitely, uh, you know, winning. Right. So there is a bit of sophistication to this analysis, right? And actually, I challenged some of this that was going around Twitter, because the assumption is, oh, the the Ethereum's moving off exchanges. Therefore, people are going to hodl it, and I'm like, well, that's that's not very sophisticated, because what if the ether is being removed, like you just said, from Binance to Uniswap or some sort of DeFi application? Well, someone can still sell it over there, right? So they might still intend to sell it just on a decentralized exchange. Uh, yeah, that's why we can. Uh, the the point is, most of the Ethereum, like huge billions mm -hmm. of uh, worth of Ethereum are locked, you know, mm -hmm. they get locked in uh, DeFi. It's not just being coddled and swapped and, and things like that. They are just like, even uh, there is a long, very long term staking happening right now in Ethereum to zero. Yeah. Since people cannot remove, uh, and there's like, I'm not sure how much, but maybe even, I don't know, 4% of the supply of Ethereum mm -hmm. is already locked there, it cannot yeah. be moved. Uh, removed until the next phase of Ethereum comes. So there are certain ways to check how much is locked. And mm -hmm. usually the people who locked who lock Ethereum, uh, they 
don't tend to sell. They just chase higher yields. They may unlock it to lock it somewhere else, things like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, more and more Ethereum is getting locked. Okay, great. So the next thing I want to say is that what I like about on-chain metrics and public blockchains in particular is that they help level the playing field from you know, investors who are institutional investors versus retail investors. So typically there would be like a hierarchy in terms of access to better, faster, deeper information in the markets. Whereas on-chain metrics, it's open to everybody, right? So people say like data is the new oil, which is fine, but if you can't access that data, then it's a, not a level playing field. So there's tons of free applications out there now where you can query the the on-chain data and anyone who's either a retail investor or institutional can get that information. And there's now a whole bunch of content creators providing commentary on the on-chain metrics as well. I don't know if you've seen any of that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that's that's quite amazing that the real retail uh, investors are having this completely transparent access to uh, the blockchain data. And uh, the point is, do they know how to use it? So the you know you need certain level of knowledge in order to dig and mm. to find the information that you need. So that's why some retail investors are going for uh, maybe paid services and uh, where that information is kind of uh, system uh, uh, you know it's it's kind of collected and represented in a systemic. A systematic man, uh, manner mm -hmm. sure. so it makes sense it does. Mm. Yeah, maybe that's and what it's you were saying. aggregated yes yeah there's uh, you, the, there was the point you made just there about the is what i was saying about sophistication so you could just look at one thing that says oh the amount of crypto on exchanges is falling and then leave it at that whereas like well it's not as simple as that you need to sort of combine it with other data and if you don't know what you're doing exactly. you can't combine it to get any meaning out of it you might actually make it come to a conclusion that's wrong if you, if you don't know what you're doing, right? So that is valid as well, <clears throat> excuse me. So the last thing I just want to touch on is, I suppose when it comes to like privacy oriented cryptos, they're, they're more difficult to do on-chain metrics on. Does, is that right? Because a lot of the transactional data on private coins are private because they're private. So I suppose that screws with on-chain analysis. Yep. Well, it depends. Uh, for example, if you're talking about Monero, Monero is private by default, so mm -hmm. we cannot really analyze it. Uh, we can't analyze anything on Monero. Um, but if you're talking about uh, cryptocurrencies that have uh, optional privacy, like Dash or Zcash, yeah, we can uh, check lots of info. And I don't know, I, I'm against optional privacy since... Uh, Quite interestingly, when people are faced with option privacy, they usually decide to don't use the privacy features and just go bare and uh, transparent. And so, yeah, like, I don't know, 95% of the users of Dash or, I don't know, Zcash are actually not using the privacy features. And gotcha. this, is a, this is a problem for the rest of the, for like, the remaining 5% who are using the privacy features since uh, it de uh, anonymize, anonymize them, yes. you know, it makes them less anonymous mm. um, due to the technology and the way it works. So for me, I mean, optional privacy and those coins are not really, um, uh, they wouldn't be my choice for, for if I want to use a privacy, privacy coin. So yeah, Monero or, or some other you know, uh, cryptocurrency, which is private by default, would be my choice if you don't want any information to be transparent. Sure, sure. So there's one thing I want to make clear for the viewers here is when we're talking about like, analyzing the blockchain, right? Well, we know, because people say, oh, is Bitcoin private? And we say it's like pseudonymous, like it's, it's sort of private, but sort of not private. What the hell does that mean? Well, the reason, like I said earlier, the reason we know that money is flowing to exchanges is because they're reusing their addresses. So we know that that is Binance's Ethereum address or whatever it happens to be. But I don't want the viewers to get the wrong idea that somehow the on-chain analysis can uniquely identify them. It can't do that, can it? 
Yeah, of course. And also when I'm talking about this de-anonymization of the users, I'm not talking about the names and surnames exactly, and right. real, real de-anonymization. I'm talking about uh, the time when the transactions were done. I'm talking about the address from which it was done to another address. And when I'm talking about the address, it's just a string of random numbers and, and right. letters. It's not like a physical address. It's not uh, a, a bank account like which did you know which bank it is or it can be connected to the particular user but some people want to go private so not even this information is out there mm. um so yeah but when we're talking about uh, pseudonyms or or uh, like the level of privacy that you have when you're using bitcoin yeah no one will know your name no one no one will know your address or who you are and who you're sending to but they can just see you know people when they when they look at the blockchain explorers they can see a huge amount of transactions that happen they can go into each one if they have time <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know just look at how uh, you know the amounts that were sent the addresses that were sent from and to or the timestamp like when when it happened but and they can also see if this address was transacting uh, to some other addresses or anything but they cannot connect it to a particular person exactly unless you want them to so if i have um yeah it's so some content creator posts their bitcoin address on their website well they've kind of created a link between themselves exactly. and that address so they've done that voluntarily but if that address would just you know just on the blockchain you'd you'd be you'd know that that address was being reused but you wouldn't necessarily know who that was right so i just wanted to include that exactly. in the uh, in the episode today okay great so uh any anything else you've got to share with us uh in terms of on-chain metrics before we close it out today well uh I don't know. I suggest to the viewers to, uh, you know, uh, pay attention to how their tokens are performing uh, in regards to the on-chain metrics, in, in regards to number of transactions, number of users, number of wallets, number of active monthly wallet, and how those things are performing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's very, very important. And of course, they can follow Vice or some other analytic company which is doing. Um, you know, which analyzes this data for them. As uh, as you said, you know, I may notice uh, some things like outflow or um, dec decrease or increase, but uh, I'm always digging for the reason because mm. it can be completely stupid reason. Like uh, I don't know, if you're looking at the um, inflows. And they're very large, like I don't know, 500 million into one exchange. I would want to check if there were some tether, mm. uh, tether printed, and were they sent to Binance or something like that? Are they kind of uh, rigging the metric? And you know, th there are all those small bits and pieces that mm. should be taken into account. That is a fantastic point. I'm gonna I'm gonna build on that for a sec, because data uh, in its naked form. It doesn't have any meaning. It's just numbers. So you need a human being like yourself to look at that data, piece it together and figure out what it means. Right. And that can only come from a human mind. Right. The, the algorithms can crunch numbers, but they, but they don't know what it means. Right. If you see, for example, tons of money flow in from uh, into Binance for, for Tether, for example, well, you can say, well, 500 million of tether was just minted and sent straight there you can go maybe that's probably Binance's money but those conclusions can only be come to can only be came to by an analyst you know with a thinking mind right so that was that was an absolutely excellent point then yeah yeah well yes <laughs> also uh, we have a lot of analysts that are uh, working on um, algorithms as well and uh, you know aggregating data which we think should be aggregated and mm -hmm. uh, there, there are a lot of things that uh, help us out like that yeah. in order that... to create a better an analysis absolutely Great stuff. So lots of great insights there, Maria. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, myself and all of you, thank you very much for being on today. And we look forward to your next appearance. Um, other than that, that is all for this week's for Weiss Crypto Sunday special. Keep your eye on your inboxes for next week's episode. Until then, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.
बाय